All right, so our morning discussion today is focused on Sweeney Todd. Where are we going to start? Man himself. So, right. yeah. so what do you, uh, observations? What, do you, uh, what did you see? Um, like, a, there was a very strong kind of disconnect from others, like more of almost toward an, an antisocial um, personality disorder, like no real attachments. Um, all the relationships in the movie seem to be disposable. Mm -hmm. um, is it a leap to suggest that this character's personality is defined through the cardinal trait of a blatant disregard for and violation of others' rights? Yeah. We're okay yes. with that? All right. And that, that is the cardinal trait. That's the defining feature of antisocial personality. Does he have antisocial personality disorder? And what would you be looking for to perhaps support that diagnosis? <clears throat> I think part of it would also be like the guilt um, after the violation of rights, um, whether or not there's a feeling of guilt and remorse. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, what, one of the things I think is kind of interesting about that idea is to the extent that he's grieving carrying us through Kubler-Ross's five stages of grief, he might be stagnated of all places, depression slash guilt. So um, that would be interesting because that, that is a little confusing to tease that away. Um, do you find that he has remorse or not? No. I don't no. think he does. And again, interesting in that if he is stagnated at the stage of depression and guilt. He expresses that, he works through that in the way that he does, without remorse, without any feelings of guilt, which is interesting. What else might you look for to support a diagnosis, a provisional diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder in this patient? So there evidence of conduct disorder as a child? Yeah, is it there? No. Not, not no. documented as such. No, right? Matter of fact, if we really focus on the plot of this movie, you could even make a case that despite not, not having information, that it does appear reasonable to assume that he does not have evidence of conduct prior to the age, because so much is put into this being a tale of revenge. And if that is the case, and most people would think that is the case, um, it, it is very likely that there is no evidence of cruelty to animals or destruction of property or oppositional and defiance behavior towards authority figures prior to the age of 15. So if that's the case, what do we think about this antisocial-like behavior? Like it's, it's in response to the tra traumatic stressor rather than like an inherent personality disorder. Exactly right. And in cases like this, the clinical term that you might hear used to describe this behavior is psychopathy. Right? Very broad term. And in this case, psychopathy is used to identify antisocial-like behavior in someone with no history of conduct disorder, but a history of trauma, and more specifically, maladaptive coping mechanisms to address or work through that trauma. Yeah, so could you consider this, uh, uh, like, I don't know, this could be completely wrong, but like, is it kind of like acting out? Because it's kind of an extreme version? Yeah. The, the, only, the, only, the only thing I would say that would count against your idea is that I'm not so sure um, I'd even say could it be. I think it's absolutely acting out. So I think, I think you nailed it. Yeah. Right. So, uh, now, what's interesting, uh, from a personality perspective, I mean, that defense mechanisms are thought to be the core of personality and personality development. One of the ways, one of the predictors of his having done this is if he had maladaptively employed acting out in other contexts, right? Because when an individual rigidly 
goes to a single defense, that could get you in trouble. Uh, you may have acted out before, but to the extent that you remain flexible and in dealing with stress and anxiety, maybe the next hour you split it, and then after that, altruism, and after that, sublimation, well, that's ego strength. The ego's strength to be able to adapt and use multiple defenses. That level of flexibility is protected. The opposite, which poses risk of developing a personality disorder, is that inflexibility and rigidity. So if this character showed acting out, demonstrated acting out in other contexts, we would have identified, or maybe a psychiatrist would have identified, perhaps even in prison, that he was at risk for doing what he did. Hence, while conduct disorder is needed for the diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder, because conduct disorder often describes behavior that results from acting out, cruelty to animals, destruction of property. Any other defenses in the Sweeney talk? Mm -hmm. Probably not, all right? Any other behaviors you'd like to discuss in Sweeney Todd? Sweeney Todd, the, the, the character. He like sees the razor as part of his arm, like it's like the first scene. So I, I was trying to think, I know it has to be something, but I, I'm just trying to think about what it is. Maybe it's just Johnny Depp carrying it over from Edward Scissorhands. This is like the Edward Scissorhands like dark universe. Um, he's yeah, like, all of a sudden he's like, oh, now my arm's complete. I'm like, well, do you actually think it's so, like, when you truly believe it? Hmm. Is that like, you're just kind of, or are you just very much so attached to your answers? I'd have to think through that a little bit. I mean, uh, you know, the low hanging fruit would be that upon realizing his goal and the means to achieve that goal, it all becomes part of him. He owns it. Hence, that straight razor's identified as part of me. Um, so I, I think that part's in place. But I think, uh, to your point, I think it's even deeper than that. Uh, but I, I have to think through it. So this is, I mean, this is, you know, thinking a little abstractly, but I will say, I, I, I definitely noticed in the movie you know, he, he was, there's like, there was this ritualistic, you know, like singing with, you know, with the razor and calling, he, he'd be singing, you know, saying my friend and like looking at the razor and there was just this odd attachment with the razor. And then also just thinking about like, you know, he's like looking at his reflection, you know, in the razor and this kind of obviously, you know, presents like a distorted view of himself. You know, I mean, this is a person who clearly has a distorted view of reality and a psychopath. So I just thought like there is some interesting... I'm not sure what to make of it, but I agree that I, I certainly also noticed that there's some weird ritualistic behavior with the razor and, you know, around these different killings and how he sees himself as a reflection in the razor and how he views himself versus how others would obviously mm -hmm. view his behavior. I'm not, I'm not sure what to make of it, but I definitely noticed that, that so, pattern as well. You know, from a, from a psychiatry perspective, uh, one question is prior to the incarceration, was he a bar book? Yes. Who was? Yeah. Uh, because it, you know, if he wasn't, and, and let me actually ask before I go forward with this, um, is his having been a barber prior to having been incarcerated meaningful in the plot? Is it necessary? Not necessarily. It means like he's more skilled at the trade, like he has the necessary ability to start shop but he it doesn't necessarily play a lot in because he's changed his name and identity he's not trying to be associated with who he was right and and i, th I think you, uh, you what you said then allows me to even take this take this further if they had edited that part out of this movie if um i wonder if his assumption of a new identity uh, would allow us to discuss maybe what's going on and explain what's going on specifically with that razor and how it is viewed, how it is experienced. Uh, everything, every, every, everything everyone has mentioned up until this point. Because if there's an assumption of a new identity, this might be a psychogenic feud, right? This might be 
this might be dissociative amnesia with fugue. Now, if that, again, this is something like a reimagined Sweeney time, because I don't think they really go in this direction or even give us enough detail to really provide support for this, but if they were to write a reimagined Sweeney Todd, it could get really interesting from the, from the perspective that we're talking about a dissociative disorder, which in the context of what happened to him, he is at risk for, right? He, he, pro he was traumatized, and during that trauma, he could have dissociated, and if so, he could have dissociated amnesia because of that altered state of consciousness that he was in during the time of the trauma. Right? So fairly straightforward. And to the extent that there's some form of travel right, to jail, to, to prison, and then the assumption of the new identity, maybe psychogenic amnesia would fear. Now, they have to write additional elements into this plot to really support that, because not only are they absent, there's some stuff in the plot that really counters this. But if they were to do that, what this narrative becomes is a case of dissociative amnesia with his behavior being guided by a past event that he has no recollection of. And that would really make this movie very interesting. And it, and it could happen, right? People can be motivated by subconscious processes. Uh, uh, but it would take away from the part of the narrative in this movie the way it is produced, uh, with there being such an identifiable and, I think, straightforward trauma. Uh, and he's consciously making an effort to avenge. But um, we would add in the subconscious component. Is there any other film like that where people behave in this way, exacting revenge due to a trauma that they don't recall? I'm throwing it out there. Uh, off the top of my head, I don't know. And it, it, if over the next 48 hours we can't think of one, there's, I, I, there has to be one. There's no Split. way. Yeah, I mean, that's an, again, over-the-top representation. I mean, no one could watch Split and say that it's not about mental illness. It's yeah. fairly straightforward. What's the other one? The Bourne, Jason Bourne? It's dissociative amnesia. Oh, that's interesting. Ooh. I have to check that out now. So he's dissociative that, amnesia. That was created, right? That was made to happen? What do you mean? I don't remember. I thought that he had like no, but he, he has all these flashbacks to where he, he so, so he's supposed to go kill right. He's sent as an operative to go kill this foreign, you know, um, leader, and then he, you know, and when he's in the act, he kind of freezes. He's caught and he's thrown overboard on the boat, and then he wakes up, and he he slowly realizes he has all these skills that are unusual, and he's able to get away from the authorities. But he has all these flashbacks where he remembers his form. But the whole point of the movie is him remembering his former life and who he was and how he was trained. And so he certainly has this dissociative amnesia. I mean, that's like the defining characteristic. Is that, that he's like, wait a second, why is it I can leap five buildings, you know, and escape? Why do I have, why do I have the skill set? Why do I remember what everyone's license plate in the parking lot? Like, why do I do all these things? You know, what's my past? And, but what would be interesting in any of the Bourne yeah. remakes would be that if he's following through with one of his... Um, um, one of his assignments, right. not fully having recall of ever having spoken to his superior about the assignment. So he's been built to kill this person. Right. And he's after this person, although he doesn't know why. So it's subconsciously motivated, subconscious because he has dissociative amnesia. If that were the case, that would parallel what I'm proposing in Sweeney Todd. Yeah. I don't know if there's a movie on that where people... Somebody does that. What? In the end, he does that. Does what? He, he tries to get to the bottom of why he... Well, because the thing is, in real life, his name was not Jason Bourne. His name was, I forget what it was, but it was something else. And the whole point is that in his initial training, he was, you know, if he was Joe Bob from, you know, whatever, he was supposed to become Jason Bourne, the trained killer, not, right. you know, Joe from Ohio, who, you know, has normal emotions and whatever. So again, I, I apologize for the tangent. <laughs> Uh, I'll, figure, I'll figure this out. I've nothing else better to do this weekend. But 
uh, again, this gets at the idea of these, um, this continuum of dissociation that starts out with what we could just term uh, uh, um, behavior that is not clinically significant, then to behavior that is clinically significant as evidenced by uh, periods of either depersonalization and or de um, derealization, uh, followed by dissociative amnesia, followed by dissociative amnesia with few, followed by dissociative identity disorder. So that's, that's the relative continuum. And in every case here, uh, all the above cannot be due to the, uh, the effects of a substance or another medical condition. Right. So again, a very brief overview and review of the dissociative disorders, which probably is not happening in sweet death. Uh, he's maybe, uh, he's um, more premeditated. This is more of a conscious effort. At least um, the way it's written. Other observations on the character. A flat affect. All right, so let's briefly talk about this. First, before we talk about his flat affect, I need to know the five domains of affect. Flat. So flat's a descriptor of one of the domains. Um. Mood? Type. Right. Type of affect. Your, your favorite adjective in describing your patient's mood. Restricted. Restricted is an example of what? Expression. No. Blood. Sorry? Blood. Blood is an example of what? <laughs> Outward expression. Range? Range. Good. That's number two. We have type and we have range. The range could be normal. Hopefully I'm demonstrating that to you, right? That is over the course of a 30 to 60 minute conversation, an individual will demonstrate a normal range of affect, uh, often referred to as a broad range. If not, if I was able to just talk to you for 60 full minutes like this and not get any more intense or any less intense over the hour, that's abnormal and that's considered to be a restricted range. So the, the norm is termed broad, the abnormal is termed constricted. That's two. Three more. The congruency. With the congruency, right? So your range should shift depending on what it is you're talking about. If it does not, or it should be, I shouldn't say shift, it should be consistent with if the type of affect is euthymic when you're talking about your suicide attempt and it's dysphoric when you're talking about your daughter's graduation from medical school, that is incongruence. Right? Uh, otherwise referred to as inappropriate. So congruent or appropriate, the abnormal is incongruent or inappropriate. Isn't that subjective though? Uh, yes, but with the doctor. Yeah, always go by the reasonable person standard. Two more. Uh, uh, liability. Good. Change pattern. How quick do you shift? If it's normal, we just call it normal. If it is abnormally fast, we call that labile. If it's abnormally slow, we call that over controlled. One more. Intensity. Mm. Again, uh, hopefully I'm demonstrating a normal intensity, and if so, you call it normal. Uh, there's really no clinical term that's arbitrarily agreed upon to describe an affect that is too intense. So we call it above normal or very intense. However, there are two clinical terms to describe a below normal intensity. The first one is blunted. Figure that like a D average. And then even below that is flat. That's an F. Again, to your point, where blunt or blunted ends and flat begins, that's arbitrary. All right, those are the five domains. So let's take it back to our character. How would you describe Sweeney Todd's affect? Dysphoric, restricted, 
He's not particularly labile. Um, Almost over control too, right? Yeah. I mean, so calculating. Could, yeah. could even be over control. I would certainly say inappropriate. <laughs> inappropriate <laughs> or incongruent. Mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. Same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then I uh, want uh, how the intensity. I think. Uh, I'd say flat and not maybe no blended more than yeah. flat. Mm -hmm. There we go. Yeah, I agree. I kind of disagree because, like, when he gets upset, he gets upset for reasons that are justified to him. That are like, okay, I wasn't able to kill him and he gives him a chair. That's why I'm upset now. <laughs> like, to me, like, I don't know, like, I'm just hypothetically, if I was in his situation, I'd be upset too. So, like, so which uh, which one which one would you substitute that? I would say like I, I would consider it to, I would consider him to be congruent because he gets upset for reasons justified for him. And maybe mm -hmm. the average person's not trying to kill somebody, so like you never know. But like for him, that seems like he's upset because he he wanted to do what he wanted to do, and he's upset that he didn't get the opportunity to do it. Is there any evidence of incongruence? I mean, the, the general idea is that we'd say congruent until there's an exception that we could identify. And if we see an exception, we'll say incongruent, even though it might be for one minute out of our 60 minute interview. Um, and again, that's something you could qualify when you actually present your patient. That is, during the entirety of the interview, I don't believe there was incongruence. However, there was one part of the interview when we were then dot, dot, dot. Um, so again, the idea here is that if you find a deficit reported, the deficit does not have to necessarily be for the entire duration of your interview. And that's the same thing to think about as a physical exam finding, right? If you, don't, if you think the patellar reflexes are depressed, just two out of, uh, just a two plus, or one plus. Um, that's only a very small part of your physical examination, right? And that's what you observe, period. Uh, doesn't mean that you tapped on the patellar for 60 straight minutes. Hopefully you didn't. Right, so same logic with regard to the mental status exam and the MSC findings. If there's a deficit reported, it doesn't necessarily mean that it was uh, through the duration of your interview. Other characters. Um, Helena Bonham Carter. Um, I was like her character uh, was kind of like um, the delusions, like the uh, the automatic delusions, where she's kind of maintaining. She keeps kind of perseverating on this fantasy of, oh well, we can be in love, and let's get married, and we'll be happy together. Um, Kind of even despite the persisting evidence that this other person like doesn't really interact with her much unless there's something directly in it for his cause of revenge. Um, it hasn't really shown any romantic interest at all or ever remarked on it. It's uh, it, She just very steadfastly persists with this delusion to the point of like um, being willing to try to kill the little boy because he's caught on to what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And somebody give me the background of her current social situation. She's a widow. She's a widow. What else? If you could look at the case management note, what might it include? So, for someone, hypothetically, who hasn't seen this film, explain to them what her current social situation is like. She lives in a lavish home with a butler. No, no, no she bad. makes terrible meat pies in this show. <laughs> is it this character that does, or is it Miss Lovett? Oh, sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on her her character's name. Is it? It, it, it is Miss Lovett. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. I take it back. Yeah, yeah. Something else. And I okay. do apologize. Uh, I actually wanted to get to another character, so we'll get to oh. that as well. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, let's talk about the homeless woman. Oh. Yeah. 
by bid. Um, because I think that if we can see some evidence of what you just described in the homeless woman, I think there's a, uh, and again, I'm blanking on her name as well, but there's a major teaching point to be had here, right? So when somebody presents with evidence of psychosis, uh, chief in the differential is going to be schizophrenia from other psychotic disorders. And if we were to look at, and this is, I know it's a switch of character, but it's worth mentioning here because it's going to come up on your shelf exam. And that is, if we took the social situation of that one character and applied it to Mrs. Lovett, how might that impact your differential, schizophrenia versus delusional disorder? Because both can incorporate delusions, and both can incorporate your automatic delusions. So if we borrowed the social history of the other character and applied it to the character that is demonstrating the delusion, how does that affect your differential, specifically schizophrenia versus delusional disorder? I guess it would weight it more towards schizophrenia because there's functional impairment beyond the delusion itself. That's exactly right. Everybody can understand that? For delusional disorder, the delusion, in this case, exactly what the character is portraying, is exactly something you can see in schizophrenia as well. However, schizophrenia is a more severe disease state. Schizophrenia has associated severe cognitive deficits. And as such, it impacts the individual's life far beyond the impact of the delusion itself. That is not the case for delusional disorder. The delusion that manifests in delusional disorder can, and by definition does, impact functioning. But beyond the impact of the delusion itself, other areas of functioning remain intact. All right, so that, and that's a huge differentiation between delusional disorder and schizophrenia, and one that comes up on exams all the time. Right. So I know we have to kind of cross, um, cross reference our characters here, but if we were to do that, it does make that significant teaching point. Any questions about that? What's schizoaffective disorder? Because the same applies for schizoaffective disorder. Right. Right. Schizoaffective disorder is going to be very, very much like schizophrenia. However, uh, and therefore very much dissimilar to delusional disorder. So it's the same rule that applies. But then what differentiates schizophrenia from schizoaffective? Um, time frame? Uh, no, no, actually, no, no, no. Mood symptoms. Yeah, mood yeah. yeah. Prominent or clinically significant mood symptoms throughout the duration of the disorder mm -hmm. or episode, which is lifetime. Right? So if somebody comes in and they have schizophrenia, they're going to demonstrate at least two of five published symptoms, one of which, of course, is delusions, because we just discussed them. Uh, but um, two of those five, whether they're positive or negative symptoms. The same exact thing holds true for schizoaffective disorder. What differentiates schizoaffective is that that condition also demonstrates co-occurring mood symptoms throughout the duration of the condition. If that is the case, when somebody presents to you with co-occurring psychotic and mood symptoms, how then do you differentiate schizoaffective from major depressive disorder with psychotic features? Which occurred first? Which came exactly right. Mm -hmm. Because in a slice of time, when somebody with schizoaffective disorder is sitting in front of you, and major depression with psychotic features is sitting in front of you, in the duration or through the duration of your respective interviews, one hour, they're gonna look exactly alike. There's no way of differentiating. And the way you are able to say, single best answer is schizophrenia, excuse me, schizoaffective. No, no, the single best answer is major depression with psychotic features is by taking a patient history. Uh, now again, this is something that comes through in an exam. In real life, that patient history can prove quite difficult because during active psychosis, 
individuals may have a very difficult time establishing time frames. On your shelf exam, not so much. When you see evidence of psychotic features in the absence of mood, you have to understand that that has to be a primary psychotic process. Schizoaffective disorder is your single best diagnosis. The opposite holds true in major depression with psychotic features, that is the patient's history, perhaps even recent history, will be indicative of mood features absent psychosis, therefore establishing that this must be a primary mood disorder, specifically major depression with psychotic features. It's, it really is cut and dry. On an exam. Questions? Let's uh, have them sit tight for a second. Get back to this one. Major depression with psychotic features. Therapy, what do you want to do for them? Uh, you assess for safety, they are not an imminent risk, so we're not hospitalized. So what are you gonna do? You're, you're the outpatient psychiatrist. <clears throat> Treat the depression? Treat depression. If you started, pick an antidepressant. Zoloft. If you started, Zoloft. The percentage of people in this condition that improve on Zoloft? 30%. The number or percentage of people that improve if you were to prescribe antipsychotic monotherapy? 30%. Oh, good. And if you prescribe both? 60. 60. It's actually 70, yeah. 60 and a bump. <laughs> All right. So you, you prescribe both. Yeah. Right? Good job. You remember this well. You prescribe both. Pick an antipsychotic. Risperidone. Risperidone, Zoloft combination. How long do you want to see them back? A week. One week. All right. So they get discharged. One week. One week later, they do not show up to your office appointment. Instead, you get a call from the medical examiner. Cause of death is ruled to be a suicide. Oh, geez. Exactly, that's everybody's reaction, right? That's exactly right. You liable? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> Why? <laughs> uh, because, you know, Zola, all these SSRIs have risk of suicidality in the, in the initial week or so of onset. They do carry that black box warning of increased suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. Children and young adults. Would you? Would you? I mean, would you, in common practice, partic particularly if the history warranted this concern, would you like bridge them with Xanax or something of that nature? Um, not necessarily. Now, that's not no. the way to go with this. Now, okay. No. Um, is there like a contraindication for um, like the SSRIs to start them if the patient's having like um, like like a manic episode? Yeah. Okay, but this wouldn't characterize. No, I'm not going to throw a curveball at you. I'm not going to say this was bipolar the whole time. No curveballs. Um, so you're getting sued, which means that your organization, your office, is going to copy the chart that you're going to review to answer questions from the prosecuting attorney. Uh, one question, of course, is going to be the findings of your mental status exam. You're, upon your initial review, you clearly have documented patient denies any SI. Are you liable now? Yeah. Why? Because it's still a black box warning. We know that it can cause it even if it's not there. So you look further at your medical record and you clearly, in your informed consent, state that this medication can increase suicidal thoughts. And the patient understands this and provided their informed consent. Are you liable now? Lawyers find a way. Huh? Lawyers yeah. find a way. So will yours. <laughs> so will your defense attorney. The answer is yes. Why? I mean, and it's not because lawyers. <laughs> it seems. It also seems weird. like I, I don't know how valid it is to like tell someone that the medication you're giving them might make them so unreasonable, like so out of it that they're gonna take their own life. Like that's a that I feel like just the informed consent isn't necessarily like enough to remove the threat, right? Isn't that the legal premise behind it? Oh, no, no. Matter of fact, again, I'll, um, in, in reviewing your case record again, mm -hmm. um, you know, not that you have to because your mental status may infer this, but just in case, you did document that the patient understands the conversation and has the capacity to make informed decisions, and yeah, their informed consent is documented. Okay. 
that was, yeah, that was going to be my fault was, you know, did they have capacity, if they were actively uh, psychotic? No. Uh, no. Uh, no, no. No psychosis at this, well, okay. yes, psychosis at the time. However, the patient has full decision-making capacity is on that chart. So, mm -hmm. you liable now? Yes. Why? What do, you, what do I want to hear other than just no SI in the mental status exam? <clears throat> oh, no previous attempts? Uh, no. Well, save that thought, though, please. No family history? Uh, no, save, save that thought, please. Uh, you know, like access? Nope. I mean, you're asking if they have access to guns or access to, you know, things that they could use to kill themselves. Okay. Uh, access to firearms. Um, you check. You documented it. What else? Passive thoughts. Uh, no. So, no SI, no access. What? No access specifically to firearms. Next. Homicide on each. Always. Next. Huh? Plan. Good. Good. Plan. Yeah. If you miss the plan, they're not going to even go to court. They're going to settle. Imminence is the final one. Right? Imminence. If you were to leave this appointment right now and go home, would you kill yourself? Imminence. Mm -hmm. right? Those four have to be asked. Right? Have you taken your OSCE yet? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> miss one of those four in your OSCE, you're failing. Just a heads up. It's the way the OSCE is built. Right, on, this, on the suicidal patient, right? Suicidal ideation, and of course that is homicidal, ide homicidal ideation too. A plan, imminence, and access to firearms. Those are the four must asks on your OSCE and in real life, period. I don't think I got all four. No. You'll be remediating, don't worry about it. We, we build this in, we anticipate this. It's a teaching, it's a teaching tool. Uh, so when you go on to your future practice that is not in psychiatry but choose to treat psychiatrically ill patients, you will never forget to go through this. No, don't sweat it. All right, so here we are. Did you check the medical record? All four are there. Are you liable now? Yes, you are. Why? You said it before. Yes. <laughs> Previous suicide attempts. And by asking about previous suicide attempts, what are you getting at? If they've been uh, having SI before, like in the past. And, and what relevance is that to you as a clinician, as a prescriber? The highest predictor of completed suicide is a previous attempt. Exactly right. We're going to play a little crystal ball here. Uh, you want to provide a risk assessment. That's part of the, um, the prescribing of antidepressant medications. The patient should never leave your office without knowing the risk. And when you provide the risk assessment, the suicide risk factors listed spill out the word sad persons. So it's referred to as the sad persons scale. The P stands for previous attempt. You will tell the patient you were either at modest, patient will always be at least modest risk or low risk. They can't, they're, they're never at no risk intermediate or high. They have to know. Of course, if they endorse organized plan, organized plan, the O in sad persons, they're imminent risk, but that's the easy one, right? They have, they have to go into the hospital. Otherwise, low, intermediate, high. They have to know that. And they have to discuss with you, or you have to discuss with them, what modifiable risk factors they have and what you're doing in the treatment plan to address each and every one of them. So that's a two-step process. Discuss their overall risk, discuss the modifiable risk factors that are contributing to that risk, and then in your treatment plan, identify what you're doing in addressing each and every one of those modifiable risk factors. In review of the record, you've done that. Are you liable now? Why? Because. I feel like the doctors are always liable. That's the reason why. Because we're the one we, who actually gave it to them. No. Mm. Did you didn't closely follow up? You didn't closely like, follow up? No, you did. One week's, one week's standard of care. I mean, even one month would be. It's got to be informed consent. I heard the benefit, obviously you're going to treat the depressive symptoms and with the antipsychotic, 
the psychotic symptoms. I heard the risks, yeah, including suicidal thoughts. What are the other components of the informed consent? Just capacity, that is their understanding of the informed consent. But there's a fourth component you've left off. That's uh, part of the risks. Risks, benefits, understanding, and number four. Acceptance? Uh, no. Nope. Alternatives to care. Exactly right. What alternative did you leave off this entire discussion to our individual with major depressive disorder with psychotic features? ECT and inpatient exactly therapy. Exactly right. ECT. The primary indication here is electroconvulsive therapy. If you provided the antipsychotic, antidepressant combination, 70% per the medical literature, if they receive ECT, what percent of time will they respond? 90. So you would hold, you would help from them, the best treatment, the indicated treatment. And doing that, and then prescribing something that you documented could increase suicidal thoughts. Again, it's not going to court. You're going to march an, EC, an ECT psychiatrist to that stand, talk about standard of care, and the court will find favor of the deceased. So ECT. But is ECT like recommended for everything? ECT is recommended, that is, primary indications. Give me the five clinical scenarios on your shelf exam where you choose ECT as the single best answer, and it is not treatment-resistant cases. Uh, That's a secondary indication. Uh, uh, so let's say a major depressive disorder, severe. So, and, and suicidality, psychotic features count, right? So that's that, yeah. Uh, pregnancy? Good. Depression and pregnancy. That goes with MDD with severe. Uh, Active MDD, severe. Psychosis? Uh, nope. MDD with psychosis, yes. Nope. Acute mania. Huh. Catatonia. And then the final one, which won't appear on an exam, but will bite you in your future life. Patient preference. Could you imagine if you withheld the best treatment from your patient, how easy it's going to be to convince 12 of your peers that of course they would have preferred that who wouldn't have? Patient preference gets ECT. So full disclosure, let them refuse it. But they have to know of it. It's got to be part of the informed consent conversation of any prescribed antidepressant. Patient preference, catatonia, and MDD severe. Pregnancy preference, catatonia, mania, and acute mania. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. So back to our show. Oh, any other behaviors or characters you'd like to discuss? We're gonna just ignore the cannibalism. I, I was I was literally about to say I, I I feel like we need to talk about cannibalism. That's what, but no one knows. But it's not a character, I, you know. So. Oh, we're missing someone, aren't we? Oh, man, okay. She did she did watch the movie I recommended last night. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't know if that has anything to do why, with why she didn't show up today. Yeah. <laughs> so, in the context of this topic. One of the films that I would recommend watching is called Grim Love. Um, but I don't want to go off on a tangent on that, just to throw that out there. Right, so, um, Any thoughts about this condition? Okay. I mean, didn't neither of the main characters, are, they're not observed eating the pies. It's just people who don't know about it. Yeah, oh, sorry, I mean, it broaches the topic. Yeah, this isn't true, right? This isn't true cannibalism per se. But let's say if they partook knowingly, because uh, it allows us then to talk about it as a group of psychiatrists or future psychiatrists. So uh, the one thing I, I think um, is a major teaching point here, um, and, and it kind of builds on this observation, that cannibalism really does not show up in the DSM. Right, so I think people outside of a clerkship might then 
draw the conclusion, does psychiatry or the APA truly think it's normal behavior? I wouldn't, of course, we're not going to go that far. But there's an interesting part of this discussion, and it really focuses on the eating disorders, which in 2013 had the chapter renamed the Eating and Feeding Disorders. And this is where there's a major point to remember, and one that can show up on your exam. Previous to 2013, that is the DSM-4, what are the two, or what were the two most prominent eating disorders that were published? Anorexia and bulimia. Perfect, right? Mm -hmm. What's the difference? Um, the binge, binge purge and restrictive cycles. Yes, but there's a better answer, and that is individuals with anorexia are underweight. That is not a defining characteristic of bulimia. Right? So to think of anorexia, we must think of the defining criterion that there is a fear of gaining weight despite being underweight. And that is simply not true for bulimia. And that is the major distinguishing feature. Because if you don't remember that, and you look at the behaviors themselves, and as you pointed out, there's binge eating and purging versus restrictive. And these are subtypes of anorexia. And on exams, when an individual presents with binge eating and purging behavior, and answer A is anorexia, and B is bulimia, you have not yet told me the differentiating characteristic. And therefore, both answers are still in play. So you're gonna be very careful. There are two subtypes to bulimia, all right? And there are two subtypes to anorexia, one of which is binge eating and purging. Now, if a patient presents with restricting subtype of anorexia, it's easy, because then that can't be bulimia. But that's not the way the question writer is gonna be thinking. They're gonna clearly show you a condition that is defined through binge eating and purging behavior, therefore, not distinguishing or not allowing you yet to distinguish anorexia from bulimia because both present with that behavior. What differentiates is the fear of gaining weight despite being underweight. That's anorexia. Bulimia is absent that fear. And individuals who have bulimia, by definition, are not underweight. That's the, you have to remember that. All right, now, in publishing the next edition of the DSM, the APA took this even further and created this condition of binge eating disorder. How in the world does binge eating disorder differentiate from bulimia? If it's d d motivated by a desire to change your weight. Right, the binge eating and purging behavior in bulimia is a compensatory mechanism that results from one's distorted body image. By the way, distorted body image is true for both bulimia and anorexia. The actual behaviors, binging and, binging and, binge eating and purging, in the context of bulimia, are compensation for that distortion of body image. That is not the case for binge eating disorder. In binge eating disorder, it's just disordered eating, that's it. And because of that, the DSM, that is the APA, changed the name of the chapter to eating and feeding disorders. And the inclusion of binge eating disorder gets away from the actual motivation of the eating and allowed for the behavior itself to become the defining principle. And it's the first time that's happened. That make sense? Because once they cross that line, cannibalism now is in play. Previous to 2013, if someone were to confront, discuss, why in the world does psychiatry neglect cannibalism as a problematic behavior? It belongs in this chapter. The rebuttal was, no, it doesn't. Because even though these conditions are usually or present the clinical practice and identified, through a change in eating and feeding behavior, the fact is, is that the defining principles underlie the behavior. That is no longer the case in the, in the DSM-5. And therefore, you can make a better case that cannibalism should now be included because if binge eating disorder is, so should this eating of human flesh. 
Make sense? Mm -hmm. So I know that cannibalism isn't necessarily um, validated in Sweeney Todd. However, in choosing to discuss it as a topic, it could itself be discussed in the context of binge eating disorder because they do share that quality that it's the actual eating behavior itself that becomes the maladaptive behavior. And that is not the case for either anorexia nor bulimia. And then that was the transition from the DSM-4 to the 5. Questions? Anorexia nervosa, binge eating type. Bulimia nervosa. Treatment of choice. Bulimia is SSRI. That's it. And Both are SSRI. Really? You can do SSRI? Yeah. And that's the trick question. The SSRIs focus on binge eating and purging behavior. And that includes not only bulimia nervosa, but also anorexia, uh, binge eating and purging subtype. So what would you do for an anorexia nervosa restricting type? Uh, unless there's co-occurring depression or another indication, no SSRI therapy. Right. Uh, right. Psychotherapy only. Psychotherapy. Now, there's another quality to this. And it usually presents through anorexia which itself is focused on a preoccupation with body image. So does bulimia, by the way, right? Preoccupation with body image. That preoccupation under stress can really intensify. And if it does, how might it present the clinical practice? OCD? Uh, well, an OCD spectrum, yes, but another answer. So you're just exchanging the clinical term obset obsession for preoccupation, which is true. But how, how else might it be? Or how else might it present to clinical practice? They fainted? That's true too, yes. Or, or a seizure, yes. Some physical sequelae of the anorexia. Mm -hmm. Delusions. Whether we call it a preoccupation, whether we call it an obsession, under stress, that intensifies. And the next step beyond those are, or is, a maladaptive thought that may not be reality-based. It's a delusion. And that's why antipsychotics are often prescribed in severe cases of both anorexia and bulimia, because both are defined through a preoccupation with body image. And that preoccupation can gravitate, evolve, into something more severe. And the next step up, whether we call it a preoccupation or obsession, is the delusion. So we'd have to give an anti- Delusion men, which is an SSRI. Uh, and of course, then um, psychotherapy is the mainstay of treatment for both as well. Questions? All right, well, we're right up to 12 o'clock. Uh, we'll break for lunch, come back in about half an hour, and discuss Night's Watch. All right. All right.